Good morning, friends. Today we are starting Victor Frankl's Man's Search for Meaning, Part 1, Experiences in a Concentration Camp. This book does not claim to be an account of facts and events, but of personal experiences, experiences which millions of prisoners have suffered time and again. It is the inside story of a concentration camp told by one of its survivors. This tale is not concerned with the great horrors, which have already been described often enough, though less often believed, but with the multitude of small torments. In other words, it will try to answer this question. How was everyday life in a concentration camp reflected in the mind of the average prisoner? Most of the events described here did not take place in the large and famous camps, but in the small ones, where most of the real extermination took place. The story is not about the suffering and death of great heroes and martyrs, nor is it about the prominent capos, prisoners who acted as trustees having special privileges, or well-known prisoners. Thus, it is not so much concerned with the sufferings of the mighty, but with the sacrifices, the crucifixion and deaths of the great army of unknown and unrecorded victims. It was these common prisoners who bore no distinguishing marks on their sleeves, whom the capos really despised. While these ordinary prisoners had little or nothing to eat, the capos were never hungry. In fact, many of the capos fared better in the camp than they had in their entire lives. Often they were harder on the prisoners than were the guards, and beat them more cruelly than the SS men did. These capos, of course, were chosen only from those prisoners whose characters promised to make them suitable for such procedures, and if they did not comply with what was expected of them, they were immediately demoted. They soon became much like the SS men and the camp wardens, and may be judged on a similar psychological basis. It is easy for the outsider to get the wrong conception of camp life, a conception mingled with sentiment and pity. Little does he know of the hard fight for existence which raged among the prisoners. This was an unrelenting struggle for daily bread, and for life itself, for one's own sake or for that of a good friend. Let us take the case of a transport which was officially announced to transfer a certain number of prisoners to another camp but it was a fairly safe guess that its final destination would be the gas chambers. A selection of sick or feeble prisoners incapable of work would be sent to one of the big central camps, which were fitted with gas chambers and crematoriums. The selection process was the signal for a free fight among all the prisoners, or of group against group. All that mattered was that one's own name and that of one's friend were crossed off the list of victims, though everyone knew that for each man saved another victim had to be found. A definite definite number of prisoners had to go with each transport. It did not really matter which, since each of them was nothing but a number. On their admission of the camp, at least this was the method in Auschwitz. All their documents had been taken from them, together with their other possessions. Each prisoner, therefore, had had an opportunity to claim a fictitious name or profession. And for various reasons, many did this. The authorities were interested only in the captive's numbers. These numbers were often tattooed on their skin, and also had to be sewn to a certain spot on the trousers, jacket, or coat. Any guard who wanted to make a charge against a prisoner just glanced at his number, and how he dreaded these glances. He never asked for his name. To return to the convoy about to depart, there was neither time nor desire to consider moral or ethical issues. Every man was controlled by one thought only, to keep himself alive for the family waiting for him at home, and to save his friends. With no hesitation, therefore, he would arrange for another prisoner, another number, to take his place in the transport. As I have already mentioned, the process of selecting capos was a negative one. Only the most brutal of the prisoners were chosen for this job, although there were some happy exceptions. But apart from the selection of capos, which was undertaken by the SS, there was a sort of self-selecting process going on the whole time among all of the prisoners. On the average, only those prisoners could keep alive who after years of trekking from camp to camp, had lost all scruples in their fight for existence. They were prepared to use every means, honest and otherwise, even brutal force, theft, and betrayal of their friends in order to save themselves. We who have come back, by the aid of many lucky chances or miracles, whatever one may choose to call them, we know the best of us did not return. Many factual accounts about concentration camps were already on record. Here, facts will be significant only as far as they are part of a man's experiences. It is the exact nature of these experiences that the following essay will attempt to describe. For those who have been inmates in a camp, it will attempt to explain their experiences in the light of present-day knowledge. 
and for those who have never been inside. It may help them to comprehend, and above all to understand, the experiences of that only too small percentage of prisoners who survived, and who now find life very difficult. These former prisoners often say, we dislike talking about our experiences. No explanations are needed for those who have been inside, and the others will understand neither how we felt then, nor how we feel now. To attempt a methodical presentation of the subjects is very difficult, as psychology requires a certain scientific detachment. But does a man who makes his observations while he himself is a prisoner possess the necessary detachment? Such detachment is granted to the outsider, but he is too far removed to make any statements of real value. Only the man inside knows. His judgments may not be objective. His evaluations may be out of proportion. This is inevitable. An attempt must be made to avoid any personal bias, and that is the real difficulty of a book of this kind. At times it will be necessary to have the courage to tell of very intimate experiences. I had intended to write this book anonymously, using my prison number only, but when the manuscript was completed, I saw that as an anonymous publication it would lose half its value, and that I must have the courage to state my convictions openly. I therefore refrained from deleting any of the passages, in spite of an intense dislike of exhibitionism. I shall leave it to others to distill the contents of this book into dry theories. This might become a contribution to the psychology of prison life, which was investigated after, after the First World War, and which acquainted us with the syndrome of barbed wire sickness. We are indebted to the Second World War for enriching our knowledge of the psychopathology of the masses. I may quote a variation of the well-known phrase and title of a book by Laban, for the war gave us the war of nerves and it gave us the concentration camp. As this story is about my experiences as an ordinary prisoner, it is important that I mention, not without pride, that I was not employed as a psychiatrist in camp, or even as a doctor, except for the last few weeks. A few of my colleagues were lucky enough to be employed in poorly heated first aid posts, applying bandages made of scraps of waste paper. But I was number 119104, and most of the time I was digging and laying tracks for rail railway lines. At one time, my job was to dig a tunnel without help. For a water main under a road. This feat did not go unrewarded. Just before Christmas 1944, I was presented with a gift of so-called premium coupons. These were issued by the construction firm to which we were practically sold as slaves. The firm paid the camp authorities a fixed price per day per prisoner. The coupons cost a firm 50 fennings each and could be exchanged for six cigarettes, often weeks later, although they sometimes lost their validity. I became the proud owner of a token worth 12 cigarettes. But more important, the cigarettes could be exchanged for 12 soups, and 12 soups were often a very real respite from starvation. The privilege of actually smoking cigarettes was reserved for the capo, who had his assured quota of weekly coupons, or possibly for a prisoner who worked as a foreman in a warehouse or workshop and received a few cigarettes in exchange for doing dangerous jobs. The only exceptions to this were those who had lost the will to live and wanted to enjoy their last days. Thus, when we saw Comrade smoking his own cigarettes, we knew he had given up faith in his strength to carry on, and once lost, the will to live seldom returned. When one examines the vast amount of material which had been amassed as the result of many prisoners' observations and experiences, three phases of the inmate's mental reactions to camp life became apparent. The period following his admission the period when he is well entrenched in camp routine, and the period following his release and liberation. The symptom that characterizes the first phase is shock. Under certain conditions, shock may even precede the prisoner's formal admission to the camp. I shall give us an, as an example the circumstances of my own admission. Fifteen hundred persons have been traveling by train and for several days and nights. There were eighty people in each coach. All had to lie on top of their luggage, the few remnants of their personal possessions. The carriages were so full that only the top parts of the windows were free to let in the gray of dawn. Everyone except the train expected the train to head for some munitions factory, in which we would be employed as forced labor. We did not know whether we were still in Cilicia or already in Poland. The engine's whistle had an uncanny sound, like a cry for help sent out in commiseration into perdition. Then the train shunted, obviously nearing a main station. Suddenly a cry broke from the ranks of the anxious passengers. There is a sign, Auschwitz. Everyone's heart missed a beat at that moment. Auschwitz. The very name stood for all that was horrible. Gas chambers, crematoriums, massacres. 
Slowly, almost hesitatingly, the train moved on as if it wanted to spare its passengers the dreadful realization as long as possible. Auschwitz! With the progressive dawn, the outlines of an immense camp became visible. Long stretches of several rows of barbed wire fences, watchtowers, searchlights, and long columns of ragged human figures, gray in the gray, gray in the grayness of dawn, trekking along the straight, desolate roads to what destination we did not know. There were isolated shouts and whistles of command. We did not know their meaning. My imagination led me to see gallows with people dangling on them. I was horrified. This was just as well, because step by step we had to become accustomed to a terrible and immense horror. Eventually we moved into the station. The initial silence was interrupted by shouted commands. We were to hear those rough, shrill tones from then on, over and over again in all the camps. Their sound was almost like the last cry of a victim, and yet there was a difference. It had a rasping hoarseness, as if it, had, as if it came from the throat of a man who had, had to keep shouting like that a man who was being murdered again and again. The carriage doors were flung open and a small detachment of prisoners stormed inside. They wore striped uniforms, their heads were shaved, but they looked well fed. They spoke in every possible European tongue and all with a certain amount of humor which sounded grotesque under the circumstances. Like a drowning man clutching a straw, my inborn optimism, which has often controlled my feelings even in the most desperate situations, clung to this thought. These prisoners look quite well, they seem to be in good spirits and even laugh. Who knows? I might manage to share their favorable, favorable position. In psychiatry, there is a certain condition known as delusion of reprieve. The condemned man, immediately before his execution, gets the illusion that he might be reprieved at the very last minute. We, too, clung to shreds of hope and believed to the last moment that it should not be so bad. Just the sight of the red cheeks and round faces of those prisoners was a great encouragement. Little did we know then that they formed a specially chosen elite, who for years had been the receiving squad for new transports as they rolled into the station day after day. They took charge of the new arrivals and their luggage, including scarce items and smuggled jewelry. Auschwitz must have been a strange spot in this Europe of the last years of the war. There must have been unique treasures of gold and silver, platinum and diamonds, not only in the huge storehouses, but also in the hands of the SS. Fifteen hundred captives were cooped up in a shed built to accommodate probably two hundred at most. They were cold and hungry, and there was not enough room for everyone to squat on the bare ground, let alone to lie down. One five-ounce piece of bread was our only food in four days. Yet I heard the senior prisoners in charge of the. Yet I heard the senior prisoners in charge of the shed, bargain with one member of the receiving party about a tie pin made of platinum and diamonds. Most of the profits would eventually be traded for liquor, schnapps. I did not remember any more just how many thousands of marks were needed to purchase the quantity of schnapps required for a gay evening, but I do know that those long-term prisoners needed schnapps. Under such conditions, who could blame them for trying to dope themselves? There was another group of prisoners who got liquor supplied in almost unlimited quantities by the SS. These were the men who were employed in the gas chambers and crematoriums, and who knew very well that one day they would be relieved by a new shift of men, and that they would have to leave their enforced role of executioner and become victims themselves. Nearly everyone in our transport lived under the illusion that he would be reprieved, that everything would yet be well. We did not realize the meaning behind the scene that was to follow presently. We were told to leave our luggage in the train and to fall into two lines, women on one side, men on the other. In order to file past a senior SS officer. Surprisingly enough, I had to, the courage to hide my haversack under my coat. My line filed past the officer man by man. I realized that it would be dangerous if the officer spotted my bag. He would at least knock me down. I knew what for that from previous experience. Instinctively, I straightened in approaching the officer so that he would not notice my heavy load. Then I was face to face with him. He was a tall man who looked slim and fit in his spotless uniform. What a contrast to us, who were untidy and grimy after our long journey. He had assumed an attitude of careless ease, supporting his right elbow with his left hand. His right hand was lifted, and with the forefinger of that hand, he pointed very leisurely to the left or to the right. None of us had the slightest idea of the sinister meaning behind that little movement of the man's finger, pointing now to the right and now to the left, but far more frequently to the left. It was my turn. Somebody whispered to me that to be sent to the right would mean work, the way to the left being for the sick and those incapable of work, who would be sent to a special camp. 
I just waited for things to take their course. The first of many such times to come. My haversack weighed me down a bit to the left, but I made an effort to walk upright. The SS man looked me over, appeared to hesitate, then put both his hands on my shoulders. I tried very hard to look smart. I turned my shoulders very slowly until I faced right, and I moved over to that side. The, the significance of the finger game was explained to us in the evening. It was the first selection, the first verdict made, made on our existence or non-existence. For the great majority of our transport, about 90% had been death. Their sentence was carried out within the next few hours. Those who were sent to the left were marched from the station straight to the crematorium. This building, as I was told by someone who worked there, and the word bath, had the word bath written over its doors in several European languages. On entering, each prisoner was handed a piece of soap, and then, but mercifully, I do not need to describe the events which followed. Many accounts have been written about this horror. We who were saved, the minority of our transport, found out the truth in the evening. I inquired from prisoners who had been there for some time where my colleague and friend P had been sent. Was he sent to the left side? Yes, I replied. Then you could see him there, I was told. Where? A hand pointed to the chimney a few hundred yards off, which was sending a column of flame up into the gray sky of Poland. It dissolved into a sinister cloud of smoke. That's where your friend is, floating up to heaven, was the answer. But I still did not understand until the truth was explained to me in plain words. But I am telling things out of their turn. From a psychological point of view, we had a long, we had a long, long way in front of us from the break of that dawn to the station at the station, until our first night's rest at the camp. Escorted by SS guards with loaded guns, we were made to run from the station, past electrically charged barbed wire, through the camp, to the cleansing station. For those of us who had passed the first selection, was a real. This was a real bath. Again, our illusion of reprieve found confirmation. The SS men seemed almost charming. We found out their reason. Soon, we found out their reason. They were nice to us as long as we saw. They saw watches on our wrists and could persuade us in well-meaning tones to hand them over. Would we not have to hand over all our possessions anyway? And why should that not? Why should not that relatively nice person have the watch? Maybe one day he would do one a good turn. We waited in a shed, which seemed to be the anteroom to the disinfecting chamber. SS men appeared and spread out blankets into which we had to throw all our possessions, all our watches and jewelry. There were still naive prisoners among us who asked, to the amusement of the more seasoned, one, seasoned ones who were there as helpers, if they could not keep a wedding ring, a medal, or a good luck piece. No one could yet grasp the fact that everything would be taken away. I tried to take one of the old prisoners into my confidence. Approaching him furtively, I pointed to the roll of paper in the inner pocket of my coat and said, Look, this is the manuscript of a scientific book. I know what you will say, that I should be grateful to escape with my life, that that should be all I can expect of fate. But I cannot help myself. I must keep this manuscript at all cost. It contains my life's work. Do you understand that? Yes, he was beginning to understand. A grin spread slowly over his face, first piteous, then more amused, mocking, insulting until he bellowed one word at me in answer to my question. A word that was ever present in the vocabulary of the camp inmates, shit. At that moment I saw the plain truth and did what marked the culminating point of the first phase of my psychological reaction. I struck out my whole former, I struck out my whole former life. Suddenly there was a stir among my fellow travelers who had been standing about with pale, frightened faces helplessly debating. Again we heard the hoarsely shouted commands. We were driven with blows into the immediate anteroom of the bath. There we assembled around an SS man who waited until we had all arrived. Then he said, I will give you two minutes, and I shall time you by my watch. In these two minutes you will get fully undressed and drop everything on the floor where you are standing. You will take nothing with you except your shoes, your belts, or suspenders, and possibly a truss. I am starting the count now. With unthinkable haste, people tore off their clothes. As the time grew shorter, they became increasingly nervous and pulled clumsily at their underwear, belts, and shoelaces. Then we heard the first sounds of whipping, leather straps beating down on naked bodies. Next, we were herded into... Next, we were herded into another room to be shaved. Not only our heads... Not only our heads were shorn... Not a hair was left on our entire bodies. 
then on to the showers where we lined up again. We hardly recognized each other. With a great relief, some people noted that real water dripped from the sprays. While we were waiting for the shower, our nakedness was brought home to us. We really had nothing now except our bare bodies. Even minus hair, all we possessed literally was our naked existence. What else remained for us as a material link with our former lives? For, for me, there were my glasses and my belt. The latter I had to exchange later on for a piece of bread. There was an extra bit of excitement in store for the owners of trusses. In the evening, the senior prisoner in charge of our hut welcomed us with a speech in which he gave us his word of honor that he would hang personally from that beam, he pointed to it, any person who had sewn money or precious stones into his truss. Proudly, he explained that as a senior inhabitant, the camp laws entitled him to do so. Where our shoes were concerned, matters were not so simple. Although we were supposed to keep them, those who had fairly decent pairs had to give them up after all, and were given in exchange shoes that did not fit. In for real trouble were those prisoners who had followed the apparently well-meant advice given in the ante-room of the senior prisoners and had shortened their, jack their jackboots to cut the tops off, then smeared, smearing soap on the cut edges to hide the sabotage. The SS men seemed to have waited just for that. All suspected of this crime had to go into a small adjoining room. After a time, we again heard the lashings of the strap and the screams of tortured men. This time it lasted for quite a while. Thus, the illusions some of us still held were destroyed one by one, and then, quite unexpectedly, most of us were overcome by a grim sense of humor. We knew that we had nothing to lose except our so ridic ridiculously naked lives. When the shower started to run, we all tried very hard to make fun, both about ourselves and about each other. After all, real water did flow from the sprays. Apart from that strange kind of humor, another sensation seized us, curiosity. I've experienced this kind of curiosity before as a fundamental reaction toward certain strange circumstances. When my life was once endangered by a climbing accident, by a climbing accident, I felt only only one sensation at that critical moment, curiosity, curiosity as to whether I should come out of it alive or with a fractured skull of some other injuries. Cold curiosity predominated even in Auschwitz, somehow detaching the mind from its surroundings, which came to be regarded with a kind of objectivity that time one cultivated this state of mind as a means of protection. We were anxious to know what would happen next, and what would be the consequence, for example, of our standing in the open air in the chill of late autumn, stark naked and still wet from the showers. In the next few days, our curiosity evolved into surprise, surprise that we did not catch, catch cold. There were many similar surprises in store for new arrivals. The medical men among us were learn, us learned, first of all, textbooks tell lies. Somewhere it is said that man cannot exist without sleep for more than a stated number of hours. Quite wrong. I had been convinced that there were certain things I just could not do. I could not sleep without this, or I could not live with that or the other. The first night in Auschwitz we slept in beds which were constructed on tier in tiers. On each tier, measuring about six and a half to eight feet, slept nine men directly on the boards. Two blankets were shared by each nine men. We could, of course, lie only on our sides, crowded and huddled against each other, <coughs> which had some advantages because of the bitter cold. Though it was forbidden to take shoes up to the bunks, some people did use them secretly as pillows in spite of the fact that they were caked with mud. Otherwise, one's head had to rest on the crook of an almost dislocated arm. And yet, sleep came and brought oblivion and relief from pain for a few hours. That's where we'll stop today, friends.